Patients with dysrhythmias and conduction problems. Treat the patient, not the dysrhythmia on the monitor. The alarms can be going off, but you need to look at the patient first. An important thing to remember is that you are not going to be asked to identify rhythm strips on the NCLEX or on my exams. You are not going to be thrown a strip and say, what's the dysrhythmia, without being given any kind of information, clinical information, scenario, whatever. You will not be asked to do that. That is a higher level function that is not expected for entry level nurses. You will be specially trained if you end up working on a cardiac unit. So let's look at our unit objectives. Apply the core knowledge of normal anatomy and physiology to the management of patients with acute alterations in cardiac rhythms. Describe methods to diagnose and treat dysrhythmias. Apply EKG criteria and underlying causes to the management of select dysrhythmias using the nursing process. Compare different types of electrical therapies and their uses, possible complications, and nursing implications. So let's look at our normal conduction uh, in the adult patient. So electrical impulses, normal conduction is generated by the SA node, the sinoatrial node, otherwise known as the pacemaker of the heart, and its intrinsic rate in adults is 60 to 100 beats per minute. The impulse travels to the AV node where it is slowed down slightly, uh, so the AV node can generate 40 to 60 beats per minute. The impulse moves through the bundle of His, passes into the right and left bundle branches, and terminates in the Purkinje fibers, which have an intrinsic rate of 20 to 40 beats per minute. So if there is a complete block of that impulse between the atria and the ventricles, so the atria don't, uh, the ventricles don't know what to do, the Purkinje fibers can generate impulses and cause contractions at about 20 to 40 beats per minute, which really isn't compatible with good cardiac output. Um, so we need to do something for that patient pretty quickly. Now, there is a concept called automaticity, and that is the capacity of all cardiac cells to generate an impulse, an electrical impulse, and that electrical impulse is what causes atrial or ventricular contraction. But it should only be done by those cells that are along the conduction pathway. Those cells outside of the conduction pathway are not supposed to exert their automaticity, generate electrical impulses, and causing contractions. When that happens, that is referred to as an ectopic beat. Just like an ectopic pregnancy is one that is implanted outside of the uterus where it's supposed to be, Ectopic beats are those contractions of the atria or ventricles that are caused by automaticity, cardiac cells that are generating electrical impulses that aren't supposed to be doing it because they're not on the conduction pathway. They haven't been invited to the party and they're not supposed to show up. Each heartbeat is one cardiac cycle. So it's the contraction, systole, depolarization, of the atria and ventricles, so those are all interchangeable terms, relaxation, diastole, repolarization of the atria and ventricles. So to tell the difference, because people get depolarization and repolarization mixed up, repolarization equals relaxation. So they, they, look, they begin with the same two letters. <clears throat> what the EKG does is it records those impulses, those electrical impulses, that happen with the depolarization and repolarization of the myocardium. So there are various types of EKG monitoring. There are 12 lead, there are five lead telemetry, three lead telemetry. There are halter monitors. Halter monitors are those that are worn by patients, usually for a 24 hour period, sometimes longer, because just like when your car has a, makes a noise and you take it to the mechanic and it never makes the noise for the mechanic, oftentimes patients can have irregularities and they're experiencing symptoms and then they go to the doctor and of course nothing comes up. Nothing shows up on their EKG, nothing shows up on their cardiac assessment. So they give them a halter monitor. So they put some leads and they um, have a little box that they um, wear on themselves and usually it's a 24-hour scenario. Again, sometimes it takes a week 
to detect what the problems are. And the patient will keep a log or there'll, there'll be a button on the halter monitor that they will push um, anytime they have any kind of unusual symptoms. And then when they turn that halter monitor into the doctor's office, they can look at the readout and see based on the log or when the patient has indicated on the, on the device itself, what was happening electronically while the patient was experiencing these symptoms. So this will be something that you might encounter um, in practice, uh, you might encounter out in the, in the community if you're a community health nurse. There are ways of calculating and determining heart rate. Here's the same picture I showed you when we talked about the uh, cardiac various changes for the MI. And so let's go over those again. Your P wave is your atrial contraction. But let's look at this, the P to R interval. This is going to be seen when we talk about some of the heart blocks. That's the amount of time that has elapsed from the beginning of atrial contraction to the beginning of ventricular contraction indicated by the QRS. So the P to R interval should be a certain number, and you don't need to know that or memorize it unless you're really into this and you want to, but it will slow down, it will extend if the patient is in some sort of block or sometimes the medications will do that. So then we have the QRS, which is ventricular contraction. We have the ST segment between the end of ventricular contraction and the beginning of diastole. And then we have the T, which tells us when the heart is in relaxation or repolarization. Now there's a couple of ways you can determine heart rate if the rhythm strip isn't telling you what the heart rate is. And the methods that I'm going to tell you are best used when there are regular rates um, that you're looking at. So there is the six second method. On your EKG paper, you'll see these hash marks up here. And there's three seconds between each hash mark. So if you want to count for six seconds, you're going to count the number of R waves, those are those peaks, between two of those segments. And then you multiply that times 10 to get 60 seconds and it tells you your heart rate. So you have about eight complexes in those six seconds. So it's about 80 beats per minute. There's also the, there's a small box method, which I don't, I'm not going to show you, but the large box method is that you can count the number of large boxes between two R waves and divide that number into 300. So in this particular case, um, you're looking at this area right here. You've got one complete large box, two complete, and a third, which is almost complete. So you've got three large boxes equaling a rate of approximately 100 beats per minute because we're dividing 300 by 3. So those are a couple of ways that you can very quickly determine what the heart rate is for your patient. But as I said, it works, they work best if the patient has a regular heart rate. So when we look at an EKG, we're going to look at the regularity. Is there equal distance between the R waves or the P waves to get consistency? Determine if it originates from the SA node. If the P wave looks normal, then you know that the P wave is functioning properly and the, the impulses are originating from the SA node. Evaluate the conduction. See if that P to R interval is lengthened, which means that conduction is abnormally slowed down. Evaluate the overall appearance. Does it look like a normal EKG that you've looked at before, or does it have weird looking P waves or weird looking QRS complexes, which then you could compare with your known dysrhythmias. Now in class, what we're going to do is uh, bring our dysrhythmia handout to class and we're going to do rhythm comparisons. And oh my goodness, I have to change this slide because it's posted on Canvas, not Blackboard. Your need to know information is on that dysrhythmia handout. So when you bring it to class, when we start talking and comparing and discussing causes and treatments, you won't have to take a whole lot of notes because it's all on that handout. If you like to 
even do more practice because it's a fun thing for you. There's a website called skillstat.com. You go to Tools ECG Simulator, and it kind of quizzes you on the various dysrhythmias, and you can kind of play around with those. But again, it's not something you're going to be tested on for me or for the NCLEX. So like we talked about uh, in our acute cardiac discussion, various electrolytes can impact the rhythms of our patients. So hypokalemia, low potassium, that patient in heart failure who's on Lasix and DIG, this can increase the incidence of premature ventricular contractions, and that can lead to VTAC or VFib in those patients who have underlying cardiac issues like their post-cabbage or post-MI. Hyperkalemia can cause another irregular heart rate, heart rate usually slower than the baseline and can lead to ectopic beats. Hypocalcemia, decreased heart rate and myocardial contractility. So kind of a way to remember that is remember we talked about calcium channel blockers and what those calcium channel blockers did was they slowed the movement of calcium into and out of cardiac cells, thereby slowing down the heart rate. So if you have hypocalcemia, you are probably going to have a slower heart rate. Hypercalcemia will have increased heart rate, bounding, um, throbbing kinds of heart rates, but then later on, when they're seriously hypercalcemic, they can go into bradycardia and sinus arrest. Hypomagnesemia, low magnesium, can also cause ectopic beats. So the summary is your electrolytes are very important and that's why we monitor them. Our treatments for dysrhythmias. We have cardioversion, which will be often used in tacky dysrhythmias who are, which are not responding to treatment. Cardioversion is a synchronous shock that is delivered so that it does not shock the patient on the T wave. So this is for patients who have a heart rate, a discernible heart rate, but it is very irregular, very rapid usually, and it is not responding to treatment. Those patients in AFib that are not being converted. But it does not allow the shock to be delivered on the T wave when the heart is supposed to be relaxing. Contrast that with defibrillation, which is asynchronous. That is used when we have pulseless VTAC or VFib. There is no discernible PQRST. So we don't have to worry about accidentally shocking the patient on the T wave. There is no T wave. So defibrillation is asynchronous done with pulseless VTAC or VFib. Patients who have chronic in and out of various dysrhythmias, can have an implanted cardioverter defibrillator, which actually shocks or, de or defibrillates or cardioverts when that patient goes into a potentially fatal dysrhythmia. So that is um, an example of a ICD, cardioverter defibrillator. Pacemakers are used for our patients with Brady dysrhythmias. We have synchronous pacing, which is otherwise called demand pacing, and that is when the um, pacer only fires when their heart rate goes below the prescribed heart rate on the uh, pacemaker. Asynchronous pacing fires at a fixed set rate regardless of what's happening with the patient's own rhythm. This can cause some complications um, in what we call competitive beats, where the pacer is conflicting with, is competing with the patient's own heart rate. So you don't really see asynchronous pacing as much. Uh, most patients will have demand pacing. It only fires when they need it to bring them up to or above the rate that the doctor wants them at. Non-invasive temporary pacing is used with patients in third degree heart block. Those patients who have no communication between their atria and ventricles, and the ventricles are only beating about 20 to 40 beats per minute uh, because of the Purkinje fibers, this is not compatible with good cardiac output or life of any sort. And we'll be talking about how these patients are feeling when we get to this in class. So we will do external pacing while we're preparing that patient for their surgery, for their pacemaker surgery. 
This is a pacemaker spike, these short straight lines above these complexes here. Anytime you see a pacemaker spike, that means the pacemaker has fired. And that tells you that they were relying on the pacemaker to stimulate a ventricular beat. Pacemakers stimulate ventricular beats, not atrial. They stimulate ventricular beats so that the heart rate can be at or above what the doctor wants that patient to be at. You may hear in reports sometimes the patient is 50% paced or 75% paced. That means that 50% of the time they are relying on the pacemaker to keep their heart rate at or above their prescribed level. This particular person is 100% paced because every complex is preceded by a pacemaker spike. So you're going to be looking for the pacemaker spike. You're going to be assessing for any possible surgical complications. They have a surgical incision, looking for infections and leakage, and um, teaching the patient how to manage their pacemaker. Um, they should be avoiding magnets, although there are some newer pacemakers who are that are not magnetic, so these patients can have an MRI or be exposed to magnets and not have it impacted. Many pacemakers um, will be disrupted by cell phones. So men who have a side pocket or, or women who wear shirts with pockets over the left side of the chest, if they put their phone in that, it can disrupt their pacemaker because pacemakers are usually implanted on the upper left chest. So one student told me uh, just last semester that their father all, could not put his phone up to his right ear it was too close to his pacemaker, so he had to have his arm outstretched and the speaker phone on to be able to use his cell phone. Uh, they don't have to avoid uh, microwaves, so some of your older patients may ask you that question. Don't have to worry about microwaves anymore. They will have some follow-up work with their doctors, phone calls are in office um, to check the function of the pacemaker, see if the battery needs changing um, or the leads may have migrated. Patients can report hiccups that don't go away. It's because the lead is no longer stimulating the ventricle, it's stimulating the phrenic nerve and the diaphragm. So uh, those are some of the things that you're going to be watching with your patient. And there's a pacemaker. And finally, patients may have electrophysiologic and cardiac conduction surgery. So pacemakers are not necessarily uh, effective for this patient, or the EKG is not showing precisely where the dysrhythmia is originating from. So we can do something called ablation. We do an EP study that identifies where that area of ectopic activity is located, and then we can zap those cells and stop them from generating electrical impulses, causing those electric Ec those ectopic beats. Uh, so ablation can be done externally through the skin or they can do a maze procedure if it's not responding from an external ablation they may actually have to open up the chest and do the ablation directly on the heart. The teaching about the EP studies it is not painful, um, there may be some discomfort, they need to lie still, um, and it, they may get dysrhythmias occurring while they're having this electrophysiologic uh, procedure and study.